I'm Phil Koopman, and I'll be talking about automated vehicle safety cases, a quick view of scope and structure. As an overview of the talk, assurance arguments are needed to support safety for autonomous and highly automated vehicles. A safety case is a logical argument plus some evidence that supports a safety claim. The scope of a safety case needs to include at least the following to provide credible assurance of safety. First, it has to say what you actually mean by acceptably safe. Next, it has to say, why is it that you think you're safe? And along with that, why do you believe your own argument? So you say, this is why I think I'm safe, but here's the reason I think that that argument is strong. Then you need to cover why others should believe that your argument is actually strong enough to assure acceptable safety. And finally, while there's a big search for the one true safety case, there probably is no single safety case that's one size fits all, so we'll talk about that as well. The scope of an acceptably safe claim has to include several things. The most obvious thing is net statistical safety. For example, is your automated vehicle safer than an average driver? It turns out that establishing this is pretty complicated because you need a really solid baseline for a human driver. And that, in turn, deals with things such as driver age and what location you're driving in and what kind of car equipment the human driver is using and so on. To get an apples to apples comparison is possible, but it's a surprising amount of work. Once you've decided how safe is safe enough statistically, there are other things that absolutely need to be considered. One of them is tolerance for risk transfer. Hypothetically, what if the number of total fatalities gets cut in half, but the number of pedestrian fatalities double? That's going to be a problem, even though the net harm has been reduced. Another thing that has to be accounted for is tolerance for negligent behavior. What if breaking traffic rules is something that the system is designed to do, but produces harm? That's going to be a problem for negligence and various types of liability. The current recall-based system we have in the U.S. says that you're not allowed to have unreasonable risk, but that unreasonable risk is not net statistical risk. It has to do with individual vehicle behaviors or individual vehicle defects that present unreasonable risk. So you might have a system that is net statistically safer, but has particular behaviors such as a tendency to crash into emergency response scenes that are deemed unreasonably risky. Finally, there are also ethical behavior and equity concerns. The consequences of testing and deployment decisions will be viewed after the crash happens, and they need to be foreseen in the claim of what it is that acceptably safe means. So what we're seeing is that net statistical safety is only the first thing you consider in a long list of things if you want to actually be safe enough for societal acceptance. Moving on, why do you think you're safe? Your safety case has some claims supported by an argument that explains why you think you're safe. It has to be a well-reasoned argument. It can't simply be because we said so. There has to be some substance to the argument. We might say that the primary safety claim of acceptably safe is true because different parts of acceptable safety, subclaims A, B, C, and so on, are true through an argument that puts together some pieces to come up with a conclusion that the overall claim of safety is true. No rhetoric is allowed here. Saying that, trust us, it'll be fine, is not a safety case. That's just a rhetorical marketing talking point. So the safety case has to have rigorous reasoning in it. Potential defeaters have to be considered. Defeaters are things that are put into the safety case saying, this argument might be false because of this reason, and here's why we've investigated that, and it turns out that defeater is not applicable. So the safety case has addressed not only the reasons you think it's safe, but also addressed the potential reasons it might not be a valid argument. The assumptions have to be included. There will always be assumptions. Different safety cases will have different levels of assumptions, but the assumptions will always be there. And they have to be stated, or else they'll come back to bite you later because you're making an assumption you didn't even realize you were making. Finally, there has to be evidence supporting this. Having claims and argument but no evidence is not really a safety case. It's just wishful thinking saying, well, we, we think we'll be safe, but uh, we don't have any proof for it. If you want a credible, sound safety case, it needs to address claims, argument, assumptions, defeaters, and have strong evidence. Next, you need a basis for believing your argument is actually true. 
A key part of this is going to be having a safety case review. That's going to start with a tool checking for consistency, simple things like making sure there's no dangling loose ends that haven't been addressed. But then there needs to be a peer review by internal teams. People are going to have to look at the argument and decide if it's complete, if it makes sense, if the evidence actually supports the claims being made. It's very likely, especially at first, that there will be some sort of subtle defects in a safety case. Nothing created by people is perfect. Safety cases won't be an exception. So what can you do about that? What you want are leading indicators of safety, things that you can measure early in the process to determine that things are going well or not going well. One way to do this is to take the safety case and instrument the claims with safety performance indicators. For example, in this picture, we have an argument that a vehicle is safe because it avoids crashes, and that's in part because it detects objects, and that's in part because the sensors are effective, and that's in part because the sensors are kept clean. Well, are the sensors really being kept clean? Your, your argument assumes it's true, but maybe you should be doing things like recording how often there's a service outage due to a dirty sensor and whether or not the sensors are being kept as clean as they need to be for your safety case to be true. SPIs at the bottom of the safety case can form leading indicators. A dirty sensor may not be a big deal most of the time, but eventually if enough dirty sensors stay dirty enough long enough, something bad will happen. And that SPI saying your sensors are not getting cleaned is a leading indicator that later on you may well have a loss event. In terms of why you believe your argument, if the SPIs come out the way you expect, your argument sounds good. If the SPIs show that your claims are not true, that your claims are, are not actually happening in practice, you have a problem with your argument being unsound. Another reason you should believe your argument is that your reviewers have independence. Sure, I said that they have to be reviewed by internal teams, but who are those teams and what's their incentive structure? If those teams get fired by saying no and get a bonus by saying, yes, the safety case good, looks good, why should you believe that they're going to give you honest criticism if there's a problem in the safety case? The reviewers need to be independent. Safety happens with independence. And so you have to ask the question at least, what happens to reviewers who say no? And go from there to make sure your reviews are not only technically competent, but also have independent reviewers who are incentivized to find problems instead of gloss over them. The next part of having a strong safety case is asking, why should we, why should others believe that your argument is true? This boils down to the credibility of the safety case. And to judge this, if you're not part of the design team, you need to at least know what exactly are the claims of safety when you said acceptably safe. What did you mean by that? And then expose some of the safety case so at least at the high level, the arguments become plain so that people can say, yes, it makes sense that that argument will support the, the claim made of acceptable safety. There also meet, needs to be some measure of integrity of the independent review process. Okay, so you said you had independent reviews. Why should we believe that those reviewers were incentivized to find problems instead of gloss them over? Another thing that should be done is public SPIs. How do they trace to your safety case? So companies put out numbers. They say, here's our metrics, here's this metric, here's that metric, here's the other. But without a trace between those metrics and the safety case, those are just numbers. They may sound interesting, they may sound convincing, but they may or may not be predictive of safety because it only matters if they trace to the actual safety case. So some of the safety case should be revealed and some of the numbers that are made public should be traced right into a safety case saying, here's why we think we're safe, here's our argument, and here's the numbers showing you that the claims we're making are actually true. One way to also build credibility is conformance to UL 4600. This is an international standard for safety cases for autonomous vehicles. And in particular, it emphasizes on the ability to assess the safety case. That's what UL 4600 is all about. So if you're conforming to UL 4600 and you have an independent assessment for conformance, that provides some very powerful information to external stakeholders that you're taking safety seriously and that you've done your homework, that your safety case is thorough, complete, supported by evidence. One of the big risks for safety in, in highly automated vehicles is the unknown unknowns, the did you think of that? And UL 4600 emphasizes that very heavily with extensive examples and lists of things to make sure you consider so the safety case is less likely to have gaps. The last major point is 
lots of folks want there to be the one true safety case. Well, just tell us how to write a safety case and we'll do what you said. Uh, you know, where's my example? And the problem is, at least at this point in the maturation of the technology, there is no one true safety case that will work for everyone. It's just not out there. Now, why might that be? Well, one is the claims of safety are going to vary by operational concepts. So acceptable safety and the claim structure will probably vary depending on what you're trying to build. A sidewalk robot versus a low speed passenger transport versus a highway speed heavy truck are going to have very different requirements for safety, for architectural approaches and so on. Their operational concepts will be so different. Some things about the safety case may be similar, but is every reason to believe their safety cases will look quite different. The argument strategies will also differ. The operational environment coupled with the operational concept will be different, of course, but also the role of remote support. Different companies will have different roles for remote support. Some companies have remote drivers ready to jump in with a steering wheel. Other companies go very far the other way, having remote operators that are on call, but the vehicle has to make the call. Depending on how you incorporate remote support, you can expect to have very different safety arguments based on the allocation of safety responsibilities or not to remote operators. The system architecture and development strategy will likely be different. The depth and assumption scope will vary. Some companies will have a very shallow safety cases with a lot of the argument delegated to more structured other non-safety case documents, and other, other companies will go way down into the weeds in the safety case. No one really knows yet which level of detail is best, so it's premature to constrain to one particular safety case approach. The notation will also vary. It would be no surprise if we find out effective safety cases have a graphical type notation near the top, but then have a textual non-graphical notation near the bottom. And it might well be that practical safety cases are more of a data structure approach that has on-demand rendering of particular aspects and points of view of a graphical notation. It could turn out a lot of ways. So again, it is premature to require any particular notation for safety cases. The evidentiary needs are going to vary by the argument strategy as well. I would say that SPI instrumentation allows you to make broader assumptions because you're not stuck with the assumptions forever. You can say, I'm going to make an aggressive assumption, but I'm going to monitor whether that assumption is true by using SPIs to make sure the claims remain valid during testing pilot deployment in full-scale production, for example. One thing I've seen in practice is that the act of creating the safety case has significant value. So you should not think of a safety case as a piece of paper that's created at the end to show everyone, look how safe we are. Rather, the majority of the value for safety cases will come by creating them as the system is being designed to force folks to think about, okay, what do we mean by safety and how are we sure we're getting it? Because if you design a system that's inherently unsafe, making a pretty safety case picture at the end won't stop the mishaps. Wrapping up, a safety case is a logical argument supported by evidence that gives you a particular safety claim. If you want a credible safety case that actually gets you safety, you need to address at least what exactly do you mean by acceptably safe? Why is it you think you're safe? That's the argument supported by evidence. And why do you believe your argument to make sure the safety case is robust and correct and sound? And why should others believe your argument? And that has to do with credibility, independence, and making sure you're following a robust standard to avoid having left things out by accident. The structure of the safety case is much less about here's the one picture everyone should use and much more about the safety case picture you create should reflect the needs and particular design approach of your particular system. And it turns out the process of creating the safety case as you do development is going to provide the majority of the value. The pretty picture is the thing that comes out the end, but it's not the objective. Getting safety for your system is what you should really be caring about here.